this is the Provoke Prawn and this is another behind the scenes video. This time I'm going to be showing you how I edit my footage, how I collect the footage on drives, what I do with that footage while I'm cutting it down and a look at how I use the software. Now this isn't a expert video. If you're looking for that, I can recommend a couple of other channels that I'll link to in the description with tips and tricks on how to use Vegas Pro. I don't do what you should do. The way I edit will probably make most video editors cry. And also it's probably not the best way to do it. Also, I don't do things like color grading. At this point, I'll be honest, I haven't learned to do it. And I've worked around it by getting footage, which is pretty decent in captured using the same settings or very similar settings so the footage looks kind of similar so i don't go into a lot of depth for that but if you're interested from a beginner level or just curious as to what i do and how i do things and this is the video for you i'm just going to show you how i do it now i use vegas pro which actually isn't probably the best editing software i started out using lightworks which is a free video editing software i moved to vegas when i found a deal on humble bundle which I'd recommend keeping an eye on, by the way, because they just had Vegas Pro 16 on there for very cheap as well. And I bought Vegas Pro 13, I think, or maybe 15 a couple of years ago and then upgraded it because they do some good offers for upgrades. And I've been upgraded on it like three times since. But I'd actually think that DaVinci Resolve might be a better video editing software. It is known for being better for things like color grading and a more professional level that has a lot more settings in it. But it's also quite different. It's free to download as well. So it's worth trying out if you're new to it. And I want to get into DaVinci Resolve, but it's quite a bit more complicated. So it's on my sort of to-do list to learn that. But for the moment, I'm using Vegas Pro and I've kind of made the mindset and I have my sort of streamlined technique for optimizing videos. So my initial way I start out with things is a template. So I've got a template set up, which basically has, as you can see here, the introduction sort of animation to encourage people to subscribe one for like another one for my twitch channel for my discord for encouraging people to join and then to say thank you to the members which again thank you very much for joining to all my favorite people and i'll talk a bit more about that later on and i have this set up as a template so that i can open it up put in my clips and then it's just there every time and i don't have to mess about with it so it's just basically called template Dot veg, which is the name of the files that we save here. I'm not going to go into a great deal of depth on the intricacies of Vegas Pro. That's not the intention of this video, more just to show you what I do. Now, when I'm capturing footage, as I showed in previous behind the videos, I actually have multiple cameras set up. I usually use three cameras. In this case, I only use two for the HP Omen Vector. I've done a behind the scenes video, which I've already put together, and you can see the clips in here for it. But the other cameras are the main camera, the top down one. So those are the ones that I have. I usually separate these out so I can keep an eye on which ones are which because the audio coming from them is slightly different because I have different mics for different cameras. Therefore, if I'm doing a split camera where I'm doing multi-cam setup, I want to then be able to see the audio difference between the two. And actually, I haven't done this in this one. So what I'm going to quickly do now is show you an example of that because I want to show you the process for how I do that. So here's an example from a previous session I did with the Corsair K70 TKL. You'll see that I've got three folders set up here, camera one, no sound and slider. Now the two that I'm gonna focus on for this moment is the camera one and no sound. When it says no sound, there is actually sound, <laughs> but it's not the best microphone. It's just a naming convention that I have so I can look at a glance. So camera one is the one with the decent sound. That one's the one with the Rode microphone on it. So I'm just going to drag it in here for a moment. And it's got a, the nicer mic on it. If I set this to normalize, you'll see we go to the beginning of the clip. If you look down here at the bottom, you'll see there are three spikes in the sound area. That is essentially me just doing this on camera, on both cameras while capturing at the same time. That allows me to then capture the multi-camera setup and work out which one, where the point is, it's going to be so I can basically line up the sound. It's the same as a clapperboard in a movie studio. Now, this is the other clip, the other footage. So what I'm doing here is basically going to look at these sound waves as you can see them, line them up to where they're in the same position and that will roughly, sometimes it's not perfect, 
that'll give me an idea of where those two clips start. So they're now at the same point. And then I'll just trim off the end as well and delete that. Now I've got two lots of sound. And as I said, one of them isn't particularly good. So I don't want this one with the top down shot. So I'm just going to get rid of that. And that ensures I've got the best quality sound here. This microphone on top of that camera has a better cancellation of background noise and things like that. So it picks up a better quality of sound and so it ends up with a better result. And obviously audio is very important. The next point is basically just to select both tracks, create a multi camera track. Now I've done this in the past with up to three cameras, sometimes four. If I press Control Shift D, it then goes into a multi camera setup and I can then see both views side by side. Clicking on either of these then splits the track. So basically the process here is for me to look at which clip I think looks nicer and then cut between them at the right point. So I'm going to start with the one on the right because then that looks a bit nicer and just scroll through now and then it changes where I picked it up. I'm not sure what I did on the original video, but just to demonstrate the purposes of it now, if I click here, you'll see it split the video track down the bottom. I then make sure that the audio is split as well. I'll go through to this bit, I'll cut back to this one. Again, split in each time. So just press S on the keyboard to split the tracks when it's not split. Now, you, what you'll notice here is actually there's a cut. This is a slightly more complicated one because I actually realized that I wanted to highlight to myself and to the viewers that the back of the keyboard shows that the key switch set up on this keyboard. So I'm going to cut it here. And then actually, when I get to the proper editing of it, I'm going to cut again. But I'll just show you that I'm going to get to about here switch this one cut that one now what I can do is I can just delete this and that'll kill off both those parts of that track because I don't need to see it so now it'll switch from this bit on the right hand side it'll immediately switch to the one on the left showing the key switch setup so I've already sort of pre-edited that bit now cut again because both of them one's blurry and the other one's not great now we could switch back to this one cut between that I'm just going to quickly Blast through this. So I open up, got the knife out, cut through the first bit, cut here. This obviously gets a bit more tricky when you've got three cameras going, but I do plan on going back to having three cameras at some point because I think that led to the nicest shot. And actually having multiple cameras has made life a bit easier in some ways because it means that I can position the cameras in multiple positions. And sometimes the problem you have is you open something up and the position you've got your camera in actually isn't that great. And I end up having to reposition the camera and maybe try and take that same shot again. And it becomes quite tricky to pull that off. And so having several cameras set up means that sometimes you can accidentally capture a shot that you didn't necessarily mean to and therefore have a better angle. Or if something goes wrong with one of the cameras, like a knock into it or something falls over or some other disaster that inevitably happens then I can have some sort of backup footage for that and it's not a problem. Um, so just I don't know, now I'm just going to delete the end of this because I don't need all this. This is just for demonstration purposes. Now, So now I'm at a point where I'm relatively happy with the contents of that. So I can go back to this and expand to multiple tracks. Now what I tend to do here is then just drag it all up onto one track. So now basically what I've done, I've, I've put both lots of tracks onto the same track. So now instead of having two different tracks, we've got one single one. I have to then regroup everything because otherwise if you try and split at the ends, it becomes a bit of a problem. So just quickly blast through this. And then basically what I've done is I've combined two tracks into one and two different angles where it switches between them. And hopefully it will look nice. And usually to sanity check these things, go through and at a faster speed, just quickly blast through it. So I'll just show you that in a second. Just get this final grouping done. Now, so we turn off multi-camera view and then you basically, I just drag the timeline through and see if I'm happy with it and if there's any bits that I want to delete. So for example, you can see this one here. This clip here, I notice certain things while I'm doing it. Sometimes I make a mental note of it. And as I said in a previous video, I actually end up going back through footage multiple times in many cases. But what I'm not really happy with here is sort of angle of it. The keyboard's at a weird angle. So I'm just going to crop it in slightly and adjust it until it looks like it's straight. 
and matching up with the lines. So that looks a lot nicer now. But if I end up going back to that clip, I'm going to need to make well, back to that camera at that angle. I need to make sure that I use the same thing. Now, here's the clip that I made where I went to that key switch. And then obviously I've got a blurry clip. So now I can just delete that out. And it's still keeping the audio in the right place. Now, again, this is a slightly wonky clip, but one of the good things you can do you just copy it and then I can paste event attributes in. Now suddenly it's got the same sort of position and cropping to it. And so it gets it back, back in a better position. But you can see this is looking pretty good now. And that is roughly how I edit the multi-camera view of footage. So now I'm going to use this new footage from the HP Omen Vector. So this is slightly different because of the video I did on this, I haven't done an unboxing because as I showed in the previous video, which if you haven't watched it, please check that out, is I basically found that the box it came in was a bit of a state and the device had already been used by someone else. So it wasn't a great end result. And so what I went about doing was trying to capture footage with one camera and trying to make it look interesting, which I demonstrated in that previous video. So I'm not going to focus that on that here. What instead I'm going to do is get a lot of this other footage and drop it onto the timeline. Now, I usually like to basically take all the footage on there that I've captured and put it all on the timeline immediately. And the reason I do this is because for the most part, I've already sort of worked out the logic to what I'm doing as in sort of the setup for the video while I was capturing it. So it's actually generally this footage is in the right order and it's going to be different slightly if I've got another bit of footage. You can see here, for example, I've got some other footage that I'm going to need to drag in. This will become clear in a minute, but so basically I'm putting this all in the same place. And then I do basically a rough edit, which is I work out what sort of footage I've got whether I've got too much of it, whether it ever needs deleting and also tidy it up. So now I'm going to quickly save it so I don't ruin my template. I'm going to save it as HP Omen of Vector. Now I usually actually have multiple files. So I'm going to save this as HP Omen Vector to start with and go into editing it. One of the first things that I do, and I talked about this previously, is each of the clips that I create is roughly 10 seconds long for the most part, with the exception of the slider footage, which is often a bit longer, some of the panning footage and other bits. But what I try to do is capture about 10 seconds of footage. And the reason that I do that is because there are several reasons why. Uh, one is the camera shake that I like to try and avoid. Hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate that in this, but is actually going to show up in this shot. Essentially, when I found, even on a tripod, even on a good tripod, often when you start the camera by just pressing the shutter button, there's a little knock on the camera, and it's actually not picked up in this initial clip, so hopefully I'll find some a bit later on, where the lens picks up some of the shake, and obviously that is quite jarring. I don't want that in the clip. And the same thing happens at the end. The other reason I do it is because when I edit my videos down initially, I try to create a very nice, satisfying unboxing video without any audio or without any talking, where it's just the sound of peel and the box coming undone and everything else. That's for my ASMR channel. So when I'm creating that, I want to make sure there's no sound in there. So as well as no camera knocks, I also don't want the sort of jangle or clicks of a camera being activated or a camera being stopped or me accidentally knocking a tripod or bangs on a desk or anything else like that. So at 10 seconds long, I can basically guarantee with a shot like this, which is essentially just static, that I can trim the start and I can trim the end and I'll end up with a clip which is smooth and audio free. And this one's a perfect example because it already was smooth, but and um, then basically I'm going to go through and do the same thing. The other thing is that the focus might not be in the perfect place to start with. I often start by being too far off from the device. So actually if I go back, whoops, if I go back to what that clip was initially, you'll see it's quite far over to the left hand side of the device. There's a lot of light on this side over here. And not so much of the device. So actually it might be wasted. Perhaps I start here instead. So I just trim that bit and go through to the other side. And it could be the same the other way. Like maybe if I go to here, if I go to this bit, there's too much of the right hand side and not enough of the mouse. So I'll try and keep the mouse in the center. 
And again, that also not only prevents any knocks and sounds, but also means that it's the smoothest possible action, because sometimes when you're panning, when you start to pan, it can be quite jarring when it first comes in, and then really smooth as it goes across, and then jarring again at the end when it comes to a stop. And I actually have got into the habit of starting a recording early, doing the pan for 10 seconds, stopping it again. And it's sort of habits like that that have developed over time that have improved my footage as well as all the other things I've been doing. And it's something that you only learn based on your own personal capture style and how you do things. This isn't something that I learned from other people. It's something that I just learned while doing it, and I hope that it's improved. Here we go is a perfect example of what I was talking about. If you look at the bottom here, if I just crank the audio up, you'll hear it. There's a slap. I'm not even sure what that is. It might be picking up the knife or something. And it could be anything really just in the background. So what I'm going to do is just, you have options here. I could just reduce the gain and take that off entirely. Or I could delete the start of that clip. And now I have no audio there, apart from a gentle hum. Another thing that you'll notice here, actually, is I did this on purpose. But initially the focus is at the bottom around the USB-C port. And then about halfway through the video, it switches to be on the top on the mouse wheel. I actually did that intentionally, but sometimes the focus isn't in the right place and I end up adjusting it in the clip and then I have to remove it or edit that clip to get rid of it. I actually did this on purpose. I'm going to decide whether it's jarring or not. I think it might be a bit jarring because you can see the background sort of wobble. So maybe it's better if I delete it. I'll decide later on. But that's another example. But again, I cut the end off so it's not making a lot of sound. And then I'm into another clip, which is basically just a close up view of the USB C port. And that again. And here you can see another problem that I have where actually, while I'm tilting up, I managed to knock the tripod slightly. And so there's a wobble in it. Now, I could use video stabilization to get rid of that, or I could just delete the clip because it's not too bad anyway. And basically what I'm just trying to do here is focus on multiple angles of the product with a close-up macro shots and get some really nice shots of this. I showed some of this in the behind, previous behind the scenes I did when I was unboxing this mouse. Hopefully this will give you another view of how I do this sort of thing and why. And here I can hear a car going by outside, which I'm sure I can't do anything about because of the length of the clip. I'll just delete the end of it. Now there's not really a logic to how long I've made these clips. You'll see some are longer than the others. Perhaps it would be better if they were consistent and they were all the same length, but I think sometimes it just pays off like this. And also I'm verging on maybe having too many shots of the wheel, but I'm not going to worry about that at this moment in time. Basically what I'm trying to do initially when I pass through this is to create a rough cut. There's a rough edit of the footage and then I'll go back and I'll clean it up even more. The problem I'm going to have here actually is that the demonstration isn't going to be a... F oh, now Vegas has just crashed. <laughs> Which is a regular occurrence and an annoyance. So we'll just wait for that to stop doing its annoying thing. So, pro tip here. As with anything, make sure you press Control S all the time. <laughs> Every time you do anything number of times Vegas has crashed and I've lost footage. It's actually not as bad as Adobe Premiere used to be for me back in the day. but And so now I've recovered from the Vegas crash, which I've had regular problems with. Uh, however, it's not as bad as Adobe Premiere Pro and things like that used to be for me when I used those previously. So I'm stuck in with it. And actually, when it comes to tips and tricks on stopping Vegas Pro from crashing, I can recommend checking out Scrapyard Films is the YouTube channel I'll link to in the description. It does a lot of videos on how to optimize Vegas and stop it, minimize the crashes. You can't stop it entirely. I actually upgraded to 64 gigabytes of RAM just because of the amount of processing power this thing requires when editing 4K footage and it still crashes. And I've got a 3090 graphics card and it still crashes. So it does happen. And there are some things that I've learned along the way. If you're interested in those, I'll let you know. If you comment in the description, I'll tell you what my tips are for avoiding crashes. But as an interesting point. Now you can see one of the other things that I have with the footage here is that I made a mistake. So the other reason for capturing loads of footage is to smooth out the mistakes. 
One of the things I mentioned earlier on is that while I'm editing footage, generally I try and cut it down for the ASMR channel. So if I'm doing an unboxing video, I'm trying to get it into a state where it's satisfying to watch. Obviously, this is slightly different. I don't think I'll make this one for my ASMR channel, but I'm still going to show the same process. Uh, this hasn't got any of the ice, but it's still got sounds. I might put it on there. We'll see how successful it is. But essentially, what I'm trying to do is cut down the footage into a point where I'm satisfied of it. And I'm happy with it while also working out where the footage needs to sit to tell a story. Because obviously that's an important point of creating one of these videos. I'm telling a story about a mouse. I'm talking about the various aspects of it and what I find interesting and what is worth knowing about it. And so I'm looking at the footage that I've got. Uh, deleting the mistakes <laughs> where things have fallen over. Tidying things up but also trying to give thought to what I'm trying to say about it and what the end result will be in terms of what the voiceover is going to be. Now, in a perfect world, I'd probably script out this video. I'd put together a storyboard. I'd work out the exact script for how I'm going to talk over it, what I'm going to say in it. But honestly, I don't have time to do that. A lot of the things that I do might seem like a bodge job to anybody that does this professionally. This is a hobby that I do on my spare time. And I spend a couple of hours in the evening, most nights, not every night of the week, doing it. It's not my day job. It doesn't take my day job time. I have an actual job and I'm a dad, so I have a very limited amount of time to do this sort of thing. So I kind of have this process, which is my process. It's not perfect. So if you've ever watched my videos and felt this feels like you said the same thing twice, or it feels a bit clumsy in some places, especially my older stuff, I like to think it's got better over time, but... It's because it's very organic. I usually uh, set up a timeline. I work out roughly what it's going to look like. I work out what I want to talk about. And then I try and talk about it and hit the right points as the video is going on, as the video is playing. So I like to basically set up the timeline to look like the story that I'm trying to tell. And then I do the voiceover based on that. And going through and editing it multiple times allows me to then be able to do that in hopefully a succinct way that isn't just a complete mess and terrible. The initial pass is actually to do that and also tell a story without saying anything, which in the case of my standard ASMR unboxing videos is obviously the box, the product comes out of the box, all the things come out of it and maybe get connect together and then it gets touched <laughs> or clicked. If it's a keyboard, I'm going to show the mouse sound, the keyboard sounds, key sounds. I give close up shots of it a little bit, but I don't go into things like the software. And I don't go into the other things where I'd be talking about it and explaining it. I just sort of, it's just the initial bit. Now those ASMR unboxing videos, if you've not seen them already on my other channel, please subscribe to that. Help me out. I haven't even got a thousand subscribers on it yet. It's a very slow growth. Those videos are essentially an uncut version of my final product. Actually, what I'm creating is not uncut it is still cut and it is still edited but it's so i've left it in a longer format sometimes the videos are longer sometimes they're actually shorter because i don't include things like the software and other conversations in there but sometimes they're longer because i've left it to just be what it is and then with the second pass when i go through and edit again sometimes i pass three or four times that i'm editing this footage I then cut it down even further. I cut it down to trim out the unnecessary fluff. I cut it down to trim out extra shots that I don't need. I cut it down where I've made mistakes or it doesn't look great coming out of the box. I cut it down where things are coming out of the box and they're not in a satisfying way and I don't think they'll add anything to the final proper unboxing video that I didn't put on my main channel. And so I trim all that sort of thing down and get it into a much tighter format. And then I might pass through again and do it again. And then if you've been paying attention to either of those videos, if you've ever watched both videos, which is probably a good way to see the difference between them, if you've watched the full version on my main channel and the ASMR version on the other channel, what you'll see is a difference as well as that I usually take a really nice shot, something like this one here, where it's a sort of smooth panning motion or one of the slider shots. I take like two or three of them Put them at the beginning of the video and then I start the unboxing video. Whereas with the ASMR ones, it's usually straight into the unboxing. Here's the box and then everything just comes out. But with the other ones, I sort of like to tease what's going to come at the end. So a great example of that would be like with the Corsair, 
5000D unboxing that I did and the setup of that. That was a 50 minute video. But at the beginning, I showed off what it was going to look like. And then obviously that comes at the end as well. I take some of the end footage and I put it at the beginning. And so I end up getting a lot more clips, but I use them as a teaser. Like, here's what you're going to see, because obviously you need to keep people hooked. Here's what you're going to see. This is what I'm going to cover. Boom, this is all that happens. And then I go into the unboxing and hopefully people like it. Um, not as many people as I'd like, but everyone's got to start somewhere. And then I just go into that in a bit more depth and just go through and hopefully make it look nice. So uh, a point here, for example, is I'm looking at this footage of me clicking the mouse buttons and I maybe that's a bit too long. So for the ASMR one, I'd probably leave that as it is because people really like the sound of that. But actually for the proper unboxing, I'll probably end up cutting that down, making it shorter. So basically what I'm doing now is I'm just going through and treating it as I would normally at the ASMR version. I'm going to get it into a position where I'm pretty satisfied with it. And then I'll go through and make another pass. Now I'm not going to finalize the video here. I'm basically going to show you roughly what I would do there. Again, there's another bit where there's some unnecessary sound. I could just delete the audio, but I tend to prefer to leave it in where possible if it makes sense to do so. The other thing I need to, that you need to bear in mind, I quickly go through and edit it this way. An actual better way of doing it would probably be to watch this clip back because I'm obviously watching that at a lot faster speed. Because if you watch it back now, this is a lot slower. This is a lot more satisfying in my mind. Although I am looking at it thinking I'm a bit annoyed at the desk because this shot here is a bit too blurry. So what I might do is actually just crop it up a little bit, try and lift it up a bit so you can, that looks much nicer. But actually what I've got here also is what I was talking about. I start the footage early on the camera. So the camera's stationary and it's not moving and then it starts to move and that way there's no jarring effects. But if I trim the start of that now, this should be a much smoother shot. So I don't actually have that sort of initial bit where it hasn't started. We've immediately got the motion and I think it looks a bit nicer. Although what I have just noticed is that I've got the top of the frame in. So I have to do that. There we go, that's better. So it was actually, I ended up with a black bar at the top there. But you'll see the difference, because normally I just go, I scrub through it really fast. Oh, Vegas has crashed again. Unbelievable. In fairness, I'm using OBS to record at the same time as capturing this, so it's probably putting a bit of extra pressure on my system. Let's just have a quick look at that. Oh, okay. Well, it's not showing much, but I was using 24% of... Uh, 36% of my GPU and 24% of my RAMs go into OBS. So there's no wonder Vegas is suffering. Ah, annoying. I'm back again in a second. So as I was showing, if you scrub through the footage, obviously it makes a big difference to that versus the speed of actual playback. And sometimes I end up perhaps speeding these tracks up. So if I just cold shift and drag it in a bit, I can make that speed up a bit. You've got to be wary that the fact that it's captured at 24 frames a second for a smooth cinematic look in 4K, and there's only so much that you can speed that up before it ends up looking awful. And I could perhaps go for 1080p at higher frame rate, but I actually like to get my footage at 4K for the best possible view. So that is how I work. So I'm going to quickly smash through the end of this and then I'm going to demonstrate how I capture the voiceover. So I'll be back in a minute. So now I'm at a point about five to ten minutes later with, with this video. Sometimes it'll be a lot more than that. Where I've edited down a lot of the footage and I'm also I'm at the end of the timeline but also this is from the other camera now. So what I've discovered for example is there are a couple of shots like this one where I basically got the cable and I'm showing the cable and how it sits in the mouse and how that clips in and how it's a bit awkward to get in and then what the adapter's for that actually don't make sense being at the end. So in terms of the timeline and how I'm going to want to talk about it, I'm going to cut that because I know there was a point earlier on when I was editing it, which is about here, where I've got a couple of clips. So I had that clip that I showed earlier on when I was panning across. I found another one which I put next to it, which is essentially those things together. So I can demonstrate close up what they're for and put them together. And now I can put this next one in here, 
which essentially again demonstrates that it's a USB-C cable and then that plugs into the mouse and that is really awkward and I can remember to talk about that so I sort of have a memory jolt into how to do these things. Another thing I sometimes do is use a marker so you can press M and then you can get a marker and I can put cable problems in here to let me know that there's issues and remind me when I'm going through to actually speak about that. Generally, I've got into the habit of being able to do it without having to use markers anymore, but markers are something I used to use. So perhaps you might find that useful. So now I've got the clips into a position where they're kind of okay. I'm at nine minutes, which is kind of all right. I know that I need to add footage on for the software and also that this is in the sort of state where it's okay for the ASMR channel. So now what I do is I've got that sort of set up the way I'm happy with it. And then I create another file, which I'll call the unboxing. Generally, it will probably, this will probably be the review because it's not really an unboxing. So I'll just call it review. So now I've got two files. So now I've got two files and one is for the ASMR video and one is for the full proper unboxing video review video. And I'm going to use those separately. So now what I'm going to do is try and find a shot of the mouse, which looks the nicest. And I've got one at the beginning, which is this one, which I think kind of makes it. I've got one here that makes it look a bit nicer. So I'm going to start off with this. And that is essentially the mouse sitting on a Lazy Susan, which is revolving. And I'm going to minimize the audio on that because you don't need to hear the whir of traffic or whatever else in the beginning and now i have this set up into a position where i'm kind of happy with it this is not going to be the final product but this is an example of how i do it so now just to give you a, just to show you how i do a next stage vegas has a option for capturing voiceover within the software you can click and you can do it however i use audacity and the reason for that is simply habit uh, for the most part because I used to use other microphones which aren't as good as this one that you can hear here and they'd capture a lot of background noise and so for things like normalization and deletion of background audio the audacity is fantastic and what you can do with audacity is you can easily do things like this so if I've got an audio clip I can normalize the level so everything's the same and then if I know there's a bit of audio that I don't want you can easily delete it but if it's permanently there in the background you can select it so I've got some sound of me breathing you can actually go into noise reduction get that as a noise profile take it off and apply it to everything and that'll then take that out or at least reduce it so now it's not quite as visible and if I do it again actually it should probably get rid of it now I don't generally need to do this you can see you can barely hear that now. I don't generally need to do this for this microphone, but for other mics that I've tested in the past, sometimes I did. And for louder rooms that I've been in. So I just find Audacity to be really easy to use and great for capturing sound. So the way I then do the videos is basically to stay, start Audacity off and start recording it. So I set it to record and let it run, make sure that it's capturing audio properly and that I'm using the right sources. And then I start the video. Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the HP Open Vector. This is a wireless mouse from HP, which has some interesting highlights to it. Now, I've done a behind-the-scenes video which shows off how I captured this footage, if you're interested in seeing that. But in this video, I'm going to be showing you close-ups of the mouse, talking about what it's like, hovering the features, highlights, and specifications of it, as well as showing you a number of the nice things that I like about it. One of the lowlights for me actually has been the fact that it was a used mouse. So if you see anything about this mouse that looks out of place, it's probably because someone else had their hands on it. Unfortunately, I would normally do an unboxing video, but I was sent a mouse that had been previously used by someone else and the box was a bit uh, tatty. So the result is this video, which I've created with just close-up shots and obviously me using it. But I have done a review now. I've had this mouse for a while and I've been using it and testing it out. And I'm gonna give you my initial impressions of it, what it was like to use, and other highlights to it too. I want to talk to you about various things I really like about it. For example, this is a fairly affordable mouse, but on the face of it, and not particularly full of thrills, it is an HP mouse. 
and I'll be honest, I wouldn't normally look to HP for gaming peripherals. Although they did recently purchase HyperX, I believe, so that should be interesting in the near future. However, this mouse is actually a lot nicer, as you can see from these shots, than you might think. It is a wireless mouse that supports a good battery life. It also has a really nice ergonomic shape to it with this nice textured grip on the side and the thumb rest. Another thing you'll note is a large setup in terms of the thumb buttons, so they're really easy to access. Although I will say that they are very smooth. You can see here how shiny and smooth those are, and that might be a drama when using it. Another thing that I've noted is also the mouse buttons are kind of creaky and you might hear some of that during use. It's been a bit, it feels a bit hollow and creaky in some ways, which is kind of annoying. Nice highlights to it though, is that you can plug the USB dongle, so the wireless dongle into the bottom of the mouse when not in use. Obviously when you're charging it up, perhaps you don't want to use that USB port with a dongle plugged in. Maybe you have limited ports on your PC or your laptop. So having somewhere to store the tiny dongle is obviously a bonus. And one of the things about that that's fantastic is that you can just plop it in there and out of the way. And now I've got to a point in the video where I've just realized I'm going to stop it, that going through this initial voiceover, I could actually do with repositioning some of the footage. So, for example, I could move those bits that I was showing off earlier. So I'll move them over here. Pop them in there and set them up like that. So now instead of then going on to the other bits, I can then talk about the other setup. In the box, we also have the USB C charging cable, which is a braided cable, a adapter which basically lets you plug the USB C cable into that and then have the dongle on your desk and the mouse itself, obviously. The setup for these things are fairly nice, they're pretty nice looking additions with the HP logo on the adapter and you can see one side is USB-C, one side is USB-A, we plug the dongle in and this basically means that you don't need to worry about having the dongle plugged into your PC, you can have the cable plugged in and then the adapter and then the dongle and then when you need to plug the mouse in for charge you can just remove that cable from the adapter and plug it into your mouse. However, I have found when trying to plug the mouse in with a USB-C cable that it's actually been a bit fiddly. The design of the end of the cable doesn't fit terribly well into the hole where the mouse is, which has been frustrating. And either way up, it's a bit fiddly, which it really shouldn't be. USB-C should be easy to plug in, and that's not something that's the case here. And so that's been a bit of a frustration. That harks back to the glorious Model O, which I recently tested and unboxed where you had to have the mouse cable flipped up in certain positions in order to work properly. Uh, it would only go in one way and not the other, which was stupid. And this is kind of similar and frustrating in that way. Hopefully you won't have to charge it that much. Right, I'm just going to stop there because that's a good amount of footage. And so I'm going to stop that. And this is what I normally do. So now I get it into a point where I normalize the audio. And then basically I make sure I've got the start of it. So now, obviously I don't need that beginning bit because that was just for this behind the scenes video. So I select all, export, export as Omen Vector. Export that out and then I have a voiceovers folder which I open up and that's the wrong one. Due to a mishap with storage and the two voiceovers folders, don't ask me why. I need to tidy up my drives, they're a bit of a mess. And so now I've got the audio into the video. Now one of the things I want to show you that I do here, people often say in my videos that I talk too slowly, which is frustrating, because I don't think I do it on purpose. Maybe it's just because I'm thinking about what I'm saying. Um, one thing I do do that I am conscious of is sometimes I'll leave a gap or you'll hear that sort of sound in the audio. And I actually go through and delete those and shorten the distance between the points where I'm speaking. So if I zoom right in, you can see down here in this area, there's a gap and I can see another one here. So actually, if you listen back to them, so I'm gonna cut there, cut there, delete that. 
sometimes it doesn't sound quite right, but it shortens the distance and makes it sound a little bit nicer. So there you can see the basic process for how I go about it in a video. That's obviously a cut down version. It takes a lot longer than that. Uh, the process for editing, I mean, capturing a footage sometimes takes around one or two hours. The edit process to get both videos ready takes another couple of hours. Even more if I'm also capturing footage using OBS as I am now, for example, to show off the software for the mouse or the keyboard or whatever else. And then obviously doing the voiceover and then editing the voiceover audio because I'm doing that now. As you can see, I've only done a little bit of it, but I go through and I tweak all those bits. I've made any mistakes. I adjust for those and cutting out any unnecessary ums and ahs, shortening gaps and doing other things and tidying it up nicely. But you can see an overview of how I do it and the logic and reasoning behind it. I'll then add in some music as an extra track. I have a collection of tracks that I enjoy. I'm actually going to look to expand that library soon with some copyright free music from various sources. Hopefully I've been using YouTube Studio for the most part and with some just smooth jazz to go with my smooth jazz voice. That hopefully people who have been enjoying, I know some have, you either love it or you hate it. But that's the process and that's how I go about it and that is a taste. Hopefully you found this video useful and interesting and insight into how I do things and why and the logic behind it and the amount of effort that goes into these videos because this has just been a short snippet of how I've done it and there's a lot more effort that goes in around it. And hopefully you'll come back and check out the HP Omen Vector review and see the difference with the final product. And now you've had a taste of what it was like behind the scenes. I'm going to do a lot more of these behind the scenes videos. So let me know in the description if there's anything you'd like to see particularly. I'm going to do a members only video in the near future to show off how much money I make from YouTube. I say show off to demonstrate. I'm not showing off because it's not millions and I don't want to gloat. I'm not gloating, but I want to demonstrate how much money I'm making at 30,000 subscribers to show what other people might make and also perhaps to give you the motivation if you're thinking about starting your own channel or if you have started your own channel and you're only at a few thousand subscribers or less, the sort of growth that you might see. Some will obviously have it better than me, some will have it worse, but it also varies from industry to industry and I think the data is particularly interesting and it's been really interesting to see how money, views and subscribers have gone up and down over time and the success of the channel. Well, that's going to be a members only video for now because I don't want the whole world seeing how much revenue I make. So if you're interested, click that join button and join some members only content. But I will be publishing more of that sort of thing in the future when I'm more comfortable with it. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Have a great life.